So it's a pleasure to introduce the last speaker of today, Marco Mazzuccelli from Lyon. He will talk about local maximizers of higher capacity ratios. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thanks, Leonardo, and thanks to all the organizers for inviting me. Uh, it's great to be back at IMPA after four years. Four years, I guess. Um, so this will, will be a talk about uh, uh, capacities, so which have already been introduced by Oliver yesterday. But uh, let me start with the main uh, definitions. We already heard them from Oliver, but nevertheless, um, it will be an excuse also to fix notation and terminology. So in this talk, I will be considering capacities on the, the symplectic vector space. So capacities. on R to N. Can you read with this size? Yes. Okay. So capacities are uh, recipes or functions that take as input a subset U of R to N and give you back uh, a number, C of U, not negative and possibly infinite. And this function satisfies uh, the three assumptions that uh, most of you, or perhaps all of you know. So the first one is monotonicity. So C of U is less than or equal than C of V. Uh, if U Symplectically embeds into V. So I'm a bit. I'm going to be a little bit sloppy here with the with the uh, way of writing. So I'm actually focusing on what are called extrinsic capacities on R to N. So whenever I write this an embedding like this, what I really mean is that there's a there's a simple automorphism of R to N mapping U into V. So it's a little. Uh, it's a little weaker. Um, second property is an homogeneity. So C of uh, lambda times u, where lambda is a scalar, is lambda squared uh, C of u. And the third property is the normalization. It's usually stated by saying that the capacity of the ball uh, is the, of the round ball is the same as the capacity of a symplectic cylinder of the same uh, radius. Uh, here's an equivalent way of writing it. Actually, was already pointed out by Oliver. So you can say that the capacity of an ellipsoid with parameters a1, an, if you order the parameters in increasing order as usual, n uh, symplectic geometry, so A1 less than or equal to A2, and so forth. So the capacity of this ellipsoid is A1. And if you want, you can also allow An to be infinite. And let me fix also the uh, notation for the ellipsoid. Uh, I'm going to adopt the usual convention in uh, symplectic geometry. So this is the set of points in R to N. So this is the convex body given by the set of points in R to N, Z, such that uh, sum over I of norm of Z I squared divided by A I is, equal, is less than or equal to 1 over pi. Now, with this convention, if you look at the boundary of your ellipsoid uh, with respect to the canonical contact form uh, of convex bodies, of boundary of convex bodies, uh, these AI are periods of the elementary closed web orbits. So the title of the talk uh, mentioned capacity ratios. So let me uh, quickly give the definition. So uh, 
There would be several ratios appearing in this, in this talk. Uh, every time I have an invariant, some lactic invariant or contact invariant perhaps, um, uh, the associated ratio uh, will be the invariant divided by the volume of the suitable power. So for capacity on R2n, the ratio, perhaps I write it, or perhaps I write it here because it's important. So the associated capacity ratio So, given your capacity C, the associated capacity ratio will be denoted by C hat, and it's simply the capacity divided by the volume to the power one over n. So, this gives you uh, an invariant that uh, is invariant under rescale, and by volume here I mean the symplectic volume, so n factorial times the Euclidean volume or if you want the integral of uh, the volume form omega to the n, where omega is the symplectic form. Um, so capacities are very important uh, invariants in symplectic uh, geometry and symplectic dynamics. They have application to dynamics in particular. Um, so today I will focus on a Viterbo conjecture that was already mentioned by Oliver, uh, which is a very important uh, open conjecture, widely open conjecture in convex symplectic geometry. So this is one of the, uh, this is the, what Oliver called the weak Viterbo conjecture, or the Viterbo weak conjecture, as you uh, rightly pointed out, but Viterbo is not here, so. <laughs> Viterbo conjecture. Oh, it's recorded. <laughs> so, so Viterbo conjecture says that uh, uh, for every convex body, K in R2N, uh, so the convex body is a domain, namely, I will, I will use the, the word domain, uh, meaning uh, uh, closure of an unempty open set. And the convex body is a domain that is convex and compact. Um, for every convex body uh, and for every uh, symplectic capacity, the capacity ratio of the body is bounded from above by the capacity ratio of the round ball, denoted by B2n. What I mean by this is the ellipsoid I can take uh, with, the, with the same parameters, say equal to one, or equal to whatever you want because we're, we're taking the ratio. E111. So it's not the ball of radius one, it's the ball of radius uh, square root of one of a pi. It's the ball of action one. And uh, so we have this inequality and uh, we have a quality. So the conjecture says that a quality holds if and only if uh, the convex body is symplectomorphic to the, to the ball. Uh, actually, no, it's symplectomorphic to uh, a round ball of any radius. So it's symplectomorphic to a, the ellipsoid E AAA, where A must be chosen so that the volumes are the same. Um, perhaps one thing that Oliver didn't point out, uh, this conjecture is very important, has very important application to uh, uh, a convex, geom uh, convex geometry beyond symplectic. Uh, it's been proved by Arstein Avidanto. I open a bracket, but it's kind of a nice fact. So uh, it's been proved by Arstein Avidan. Arstein Avidan, uh, Karasev and Ostrovic, about 10 years ago. It's been proved that if Viterbo conjecture is true, and actually it's enough. Uh, to be true for a very special capacity, say the eklan offer capacity, or Ofer's and the capacity, it's the same. So if true, and it's enough to be true for the eklan offer capacity, uh, then uh, then the, uh, so it's true, then the Mahler conjecture is true.
So let me explain what I mean by this. So, um, right, so if the V-table conjecture is true, then it's enough to consider, then let's consider convex bodies K of the form D times D star, where, where D is a convex body this time in Rn, so not in a symplectic vector space, just in an Euclidean space. D star is the polar or, or dual convex body. And uh, uh, so Einstein, Avid, and Karasim and Ostrover proved that uh, the Eklanhofer capacity of uh, K uh, is equal to 4. And if you plug this into the Viterbo conjecture, what you get is that the volume of D times the volume of D star. So this is what's called, this product, it's what's called the uh, uh, Mahler volume. So this is larger than or equal to 4 to the n uh, divided by n factorial. And this is equal, this turns out to be equal to, uh, well, you can see right away, that it's the volume of the n-dimensional cube times the volume of its dual. And this inequality is the Mahler, ah, sorry. I want D to be centrally symmetric. So D is equal to minus D. And close the bracket. This inequality is Mahler conjecture for centrally symmetric convex bodies, which roughly speaking says that uh, the Mahler volume is minimized on the uh, pointiest possible, whatever that means, but it's not fully understood. Pointiest possible uh, centrally symmetric convex body. There's also a non centrally symmetric Mahler conjecture, but it, uh, I don't think he has any relation with the Viterbo conjecture. No, it's just. Uh, it's anyone because you take the dual here, and so uh, the bigger get, the bigger D gets, the smaller uh, D star gets. I was hesitating when I was writing, indeed. <laughs> right. So, um, so Viterbo conjecture is widely open. There's even a stronger conjecture mentioned by Oliver. Um, perhaps let me mention. So there's a bracket here. Let me leave it there for a little bit. Let me mention that uh, this. The results, the points in the direction of the validity of Viterbo conjecture, uh, first proved in dimension four by Alberto Bundandolo, Barney Brahman, Umberto Inievich, and uh, Pedro Salomão, and in higher dimension, and extended in higher dimension by Alberto Abundandolo and Gabriele Benedetti. Um, that essentially established the validity of Viterbo conjecture C3 locally near the round ball. So B to N uh, is a local max. Uh, sorry, they, they established it for the uh, Eklanhofer capacity or Wolfert-Sender capacity. Uh, B to N is the local max of uh, the Eklanhofer capacity ratio. And when I say local max, I mean with respect to the C3 topology on the space of convex bodies. Actually, it's more than this. Uh, so perhaps I say it by voice. So, uh, the local maximizers are those convex domains simplectomorphic uh, to the ball of the same volume, to the round ball of the same volume. The convex implication is easier. To, uh, the one I wrote is the, is the hard implication in this theorem. All right, so uh, the goal of today's talk is to uh, uh, extend this result uh, to higher index capacities, which were also uh, introduced by Oliver yesterday, but let me repeat it once again. 
because 24 hours went by. So let me raise uh, my other conjecture since I won't say anything else about it, unfortunately. Whoops. So, so let's see. So a K capacity on R2 N, so it goes without saying, on R2 N. All the talk would be in R2 N. Ah, not true. On R2 N. So a K capacity on R2 N uh, is, well, uh, an invariant, CK of U. So a function that gives you to any subset of R2 N a value between zero and infinity, possibly infinite, uh, such that it satisfies, uh, so I denoted by CK to keep track of this index K, such that it satisfies monotonicity, the same as before, so I don't rewrite it, uh, homogeneity, same as before, but the normalization in point three is now different. So I write it as three prime. And uh, so I have to tell you how the normalization go. So it's a normalization on ellipsoids, but it doesn't, so the normalization of the, so the capacities would be one capacities. And here the normalization is the following. So CK of the ellipsoid E A1 AM. Same notation as before, and the parameters are ordered, although I probably don't need it here. So this is, must be always equal to the kth uh, smallest element in the multiset uh, multiset is just like a set except that an element can be repeated a certain number of times in the multiset of multiples of the AI, of the parameters AI of the ellipsoid. So for instance, if you take the ellipsoid, uh, so let me give an example. So let's take K from one to eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And let's take the capacity CK of the ellipsoid, uh, uh, for instance, uh, 236, dimension six. So E, two, three, perhaps write a little bit bigger. So I take CK of E, two, three, six. Huh. So the first capacity is two, second capacity is three, third capacity is twice two, four. Uh, fourth capacity uh, is, um, is six as three times two. And fifth capacity is six as two times three. Sixth capacity is six as this parameter is six. Did I skip one? No, I did. Uh, next one is, uh, eight, multiple of two, and so forth. Okay, so this is the recipe. Take all the multiples, and if a multiple appear in different ways, you repeat it. Um, so there are many, there are many uh, available, so those capacities, as you can really see from the recipe, are one capacities. There are many one capacities in the literature, but uh, to my knowledge, there are only very few uh, K capacities. So, um, Let's see. Perhaps let me continue. Let me raise the one capacities. And from now on, we focus on general CK capacities. And the conventional of the ellipsoid, I guess, it's easy to remember. So the known K capacities on the market are not so many.
So the first one that was introduced uh, is the echelon offer capacities. Like the echelon offer capacities, CK, EH. So before I mentioned the echelon offer one capacity, but actually they define a, the old sequence of capacities. This goes back to the 1990s. It's a really cute, uh, quite sophisticated construction. It's based on a, on a linking uh, argument in infinite dimension that goes back to Benchia Rabinovitz. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, then, so this was quite a spectacular invariant when it was introduced. And uh, soon later, uh, Claude Viterbo wrote, uh, uh, gave a Bourbaki seminar in Paris to explain these capacities. So he gave the constructions, but, uh, uh, but actually the construction is different. He uses generating functional like Conley sender. And uh, in spirit, they should be the same, but I wasn't able to show that they're the same. So for me, it's a different capacity. They're different K capacities. So they're K capacities of Viterbo. That goes back to the same year. But Viterbo called them echelon offer capacities, though they're not the same. Uh, they are the same on all, uh, one can check that they're the same on all sort of reasonable domain, reasonably easy to compute dom uh, domains. Uh, um, and conjecturally, they're always the same. Uh, I can offer it all, but uh, yeah, the details are, can be a bit tricky. So I, I wasn't able to carry over the details. Um, then the third recipe, and unless I'm forgetting something in between, the third recipe is very recent. It's due to good Hutchings. Uh, from 2018. And these are K capacities constructed with S1 equivariant symplectic homology. And again, conjecturally, uh, these capacities are the same as the previous two, at least on, uh, say, fiber star shaped domains. And actually, uh, Jean Gout uh, uh, and Vinicius uh, Ramos announced this proof, so the proof of this result. And actually, my friend uh, Mar Margarita Sandon also pointed out that there's a fourth construction based on the microlocal theory of sheaves. So it's a construction that, that I don't know, actually. It's due to Zhang. So I denote them by CK of Z. I know little about this, so I'm not sure uh, how should one compare it to the, to the previous ones. At least these three capacities are, um, are dynamical, meaning that the capacity of a domain with contact type boundary uh, is an element of the spectrum of the boundary. It's the period of a closed rub orbit. For Zhang, I'm not sure. Yeah. No, the ECH, right. Yeah, thanks for asking. Uh, the ECH capacities uh, are other invariants defined by Michael Hutchings. Um, despite the notation, they're not K capacities. Uh, they are dynamical in a different sense. So they don't take value in the, for, for a, nice domain with contact type boundary. They don't take value into the spectrum of the boundary, but into linear combination of elements of the spectrum. So, uh, but yeah, right. So, uh, yeah, unfortunately today, I won't be able to say anything about those capacities. And then once one has some K capacities, so we know that K capacities exist, uh, you can also define for free an inner and outer K capacity. The inner K capacity is the largest capacity of an ellipsoid that embeds in your domain. And the outer one is the smallest capacity of an ellipsoid into which you, uh, your domain embeds. And when I say embed, I mean in the usual sense, with a symplectomorphism of R2N. And finally, may, let me state the main results. So I'm going to write it here and perhaps leave it there for the rest of the talk. Um, so I need to introduce one more uh, piece of notation. So I'm going to consider a rational ellipsoid that Miguel already uh, introduced this morning. I oh, actually introduced the irrational one, but rational is the other one. So, uh, so I'm going to take a, an ellipsoid E1 AN, and I assume it to be irrational, meaning that, meaning that the quotient of any pair of, the, of those parameters uh, is, is a rational number. In particular, I want the parameters to be finite. Uh, so rational ellipsoid. It's really an ellipsoid. It's not, a, it's not a cylinder or something. So AI mod AJ for any IJ, I want it to be a rational number. And uh, so, so we have uh, K capacities. So 
All the k-capacitors coincide on the ellipsoid, so whenever I write the k-capacitor on the ellipsoid, I don't need to specify which capacity I'm talking about. So the k-capacitors are indexed by k, and uh, let me denote by uh, capital K. Hopefully you can distinguish my capital K from the lowercase a, k. Capital K of E. I'm gonna introduce a set of indices which I call the relevant indices because it will be relevant for, for the result. Uh, so this is a sequence, increasing sequence of indices, k1, k2, k3, and so forth, uh, where uh, Uh, Ki, or Km, rather, is equal to the minimal integer k, positive integer k, such that the kth capacity of our ellipsoid uh, is equal to, oh, not a space, is equal to m times uh, m times, uh, uh, let me write it like this, tau, where tau is the least common multiple, sorry, I don't have space, least common multiple of the parameters, a1, am. So I gave the recipe uh, just in terms of these parameters. If you wanna give the recipe in terms of rep dynamics, you look at the rep orbits and the boundary of the ellipsoid. And this km is the minimal k such that CK of E is M times the minimal common period of all the cos rub orbits. So that's uh, another way of defining uh, this KM. So I'm gonna call these relevant in indices. Relevant indices. Now let me state here the main theorem. It's, it's very short, so uh, I should have space. I tried to write it in, in red so that we remember that it's, if, if you cannot read it, please tell me. So, main theorem. In collaboration with my co-authors. Oh, sorry, I didn't say, perhaps. This is joint work with Luca Baracco, who is also here. Uh, Olga Bernardi from Padova, and Luca and Olga are from Padova, and Christian Lange from Munich. Um, so, the main theorem says that uh, the local maximizers Ah, uh, sorry, I need one more piece of notation. Ah. Um, yeah, sorry. Let me add a bit, a bit of notation here. So I'm gonna denote by U. Uh, the space of smooth, the, the family of smooth, uh, uh, compact, star-shaped domains, star-shaped domains in R2N. Uh, and I endow you with a C3 topology. Now the main theorem is the generalization of uh, the theorem which I wrote here, uh, it will hold in dimension four. So it's a generalization, it's a generalization of the theorem of Alberto Bondandolo, Barney Brahman, Umberto Inievich, and Pedro Salomao. And it says that the local maximizers of uh, the eklan offer capacity ratio, sorry, I said R to N, one R4. From now on, the talk will be four dimensional. Mostly, not entirely. A few things would be general again, but. So the local maximizer of the kth eklan offer capacity ratio over the space U uh, are precisely those rational ellipsoids Ellipsoids, say E uh, in R4, 
four dimensional rational ellipsoids such that k is a relevant index for the ellipsoid. So k belong to the family of relevant indices of the ellipsoid. Okay? So perhaps I'll let you, let you reread the theorem. So this is a generalization of this theorem in dimension four. Uh, so this one is a special case of that for k equal one. Right, so let's see half an hour. Okay. Questions on the on the on the statement? Oh, the, the, by this, sorry, it's just a quick way to say that I endow that with a C3 topology. And uh, perhaps a few comments on the theorem. So first, uh, the topology C3, Oliver already mentioned that in theorems in this spirit, one would like to put C2, but for the same reason as, as he had C3 yesterday, I have C3 today. It's a bit technical, the reason. Um, the fact that it only holds in dimension four um, let's, let's uh, instead I can say something about that. I expect this theorem, actually not in this form, but a weaker form, weaker form of this theorem to hold in every dimension. It's, um, so, um, so I think it's reasonable to expect that in arbitrary dimension, the local maximizers uh, of the Eklanofer capacity ratios uh, are convex zone, uh, are uh, Fiber star shaped domains such that K is a relevant index of the star shaped domain, which is a notion I didn't define. And that means that CK uh, of the domain is a common period for the red orbits in the boundary. However, uh, so this, this would make it a best sphere, so a contact sphere. This would make the boundary a contact sphere, all of whose red orbits are closed. And I do not know. Uh, if such a sphere in higher dimension is always, uh, say, strictly contactomorphic uh, to, an, to, a, to the boundary of an ellipsoid. In dimension three, that's known. Uh, we, we wrote the, the argument in the paper with then Christopher Gardner. In higher dimension, uh, I don't know it. I know that there exist uh, contact spheres, all of whose web orbits are closed, and that are not uh, strictly contactomorphic to an ellipsoid, but they're not they're not realized as star-shaped, uh, they're not uh, realized as star-shaped spheres in R2N. So Ustilovsky uh, constructed those examples. They're not, they're not contactomorphic to the boundary of an ellipsoid. So there are some uh, difficult open questions uh, which are somehow related to uh, uh, the famous open problem of the uniqueness of the symplectic form with volume one on complex projective spaces. So, is open in dimension beyond four. Um, right. Okay, so uh, now the proof uh, is a little tricky. It requires, uh, so the proof of this theorem requires two more sets of invariants. And I won't be able to uh, give you the full proof, but I want to uh, give you at least the technology involved and roughly speaking how the path goes. So let's see, if I, if I erase U, will we remember? So these are star-shaped domains with C3 topology. So let's see, star-shaped domains and C3 topology. The smooth, so if I say C3 topology, they must be smooth. What is C3? Um, right, so the proof needs uh, two more set of invariants. So the first set of invariants is a the first kind of invariants I need are contact invariants. I say contact in a generic way. It's not that they're really called contact invariants. It's just that they, they, they involve contact manifolds and they're contact invariants. 
So we need a set of contact invariants. Uh, which is something that I worked on with uh, in a joint work with Alberto Bundandolo, uh, Christian Lange, one of my co-authors here, uh, a few years ago. Um, so there's a contact invariant, so they involve uh, contact three manifolds. So let's consider a closed contact three manifold. and dimension three with a contact form alpha. And I'm going to denote by phi t uh, the red flow. So phi t is the red flow. Now for every k, so this contact invariance would be a sequence of numbers exactly as the capacities, but they're not capacities, they were in a contact setting. So for every uh, positive integer k, I'm going to denote by tau k, tau k of this contact manifold, so let me write it as tau k of alpha. Sometimes I will write it as tau k of n if the contact form is, uh, is implicit, so it would be a bit flexible with the, with the notation. So this is defined as, I write it in words, I prefer it's, it's easier to digest, but there are a few subtleties, so I would say it by voice. So it, it's tau k of alpha is defined as the infimum over all the positive real number tau, real numbers tau, such that there exist at least k, where k is uh, this index here, there exist at least k close rib orbits i just write closed orbits. We're talking about the red flow. Uh, of period at most tau. Or strictly less than tau, it would be the same. So let me mention uh, a few things. So uh, a few warnings. This is a, a bit unsatisfactory. So first of all, how you count the orbits. So, uh, so if I, uh, I, for this count, for this count here, you need to distinguish between an orbit and its iterates. So, say tau one of alpha is the minimal among all the periods of the closed web orbits. Now, if uh, you have a unique closed orbit of that minimal period, tau two of alpha could be either the subsequent period of another closed orbit. But if this second other closed orbit has very large period, then you will have twice the period of the, twice the smallest period, which you will need to count separately, and it will be tau two of alpha. Okay? Hopefully it's clear. And uh, so this is first subtlety. Let me give you a warning. So this definition uh, is actually not so great, uh, although. It's good enough in dimension three, but it certainly wouldn't be good enough in higher dimension because as I've defined the tau k, very often the tau k stabilize. Namely, we always have that tau k plus j of alpha is equal to tau k of alpha for all j. If there exist infinitely many closed orbits of period tau k, just by the definition. So, but there's actually a way to uh, carry over a similar, um, I mean, for the theorem I'm gonna write in a moment, uh, in higher dimension, this recipe wouldn't be good, but there's a way to make the recipe work in higher dimension. Instead of counting just, uh, you know, in a silly way, just the closed web orbits, you have to uh, count, you have to, you have to compute a certain Fader Rabinovitz index of sets of periodic orbits. It's something that the experts uh, know how to do. And 
In short, there's a way to extend this, uh, this recipe to higher dimension so that the theorem that I'm going to write uh, may hold, but it hasn't been done. And I think a student of Alberto Bonanno is working on that. Right, so... Um, Now, Oliver already mentioned uh, the notion of Besser contact forms or Besser contact manifolds. Let me repeat it anyway. So, let's say this is a, we're, inside, we're inside this chapter of contact invariance, point one, and let me add point two. So, a contact form alpha as, as there is called Besser. Uh, when all the Reb orbits are closed, and that's equivalent to a, a seemingly stronger condition that turns out to be equivalent. So alpha is better when the time tau map of the Reb flow is equal to the identity for some tau, positive. So namely, there exists a common period tau for all the Reb orbits. So there are no open, all Reb orbits are closed, and they all close after period tau, but perhaps some orbits have minimal period that's smaller. When all the minimal periods are the same, the contact form is usually called Zoll. Uh, these names are perhaps not universally accepted, but uh, for historic reasons, uh, this notion comes from Riemannian uh, geometry. Uh, Bess is the name of a collective of French mathematicians, kind of like Bourbaki, but smaller, and more restrictive. Yeah, so um, now, if you have a Besser contact form, you can also define relevant, relevant indices in the same spirit as I did uh, in the definition of K capacities. So, um, but this time, I, let me define only one relevant index, K1, let's say. I could call it K, but I call it K1 because it will correspond to that K1 of the ellipsoid, for the boundary of the ellipsoid. So I denote by K1 of alpha, if alpha is Besser, uh, the minima k such that uh, such that tau k is uh, a common period for the closed rub orbits. So phi tau k of alpha is equal to the identity. I'm going to call this the relevant index by voice. So, uh, first preliminary theorem that enters into the proof of this, it's one of the crucial ingredients. There are three crucial ingredients. So first one was the starting point, is a version of that theorem in the contact setting for these invariants. Something I proved uh, a few years ago with Alberto Abundandolo, well, these co-authors, so Abundandolo, Lange, and myself. So it says that uh, the local max uh, of uh, of these invariants, tau k, seen as functions on the space of contact forms, uh, are the uh, basic contact form alpha, such that, uh, such that k is their relevant index. k is equal to k1 of alpha. So there's a small difference from the theorem in which you have several possible uh, relevant indices. And the reason is due to this warning, due to it's kind of a defect. Uh, of this invariant, but it, it doesn't matter. It won't prevent us to use this theorem for proving um, that theorem over there. Uh, I should also mention that this is a generalization uh, of uh, exactly as that theorem over there, of a theorem of uh, Abundandolo, uh, Brahma, Rinievich, and Salomao to the, to the case K1. 
k equal 1. So perhaps I should write here. So this is due to Abondandolo, Brahman, Brinievich, and Salomao. So it's a common acronym. So hopefully you all know it. Um, for k equal 1. All right, so this was the first set of invariants. And first result, I won't say anything uh, about this theorem, or perhaps just a few comments by voice. So this talk A is defined on the space of contact forms, endowed with the C3 topology. Um, and uh, yeah, and for now, there's no higher dimensional version of this theorem. The proof in dimension three is very much three dimensional. It's, it's based on uh, uh, global surfaces of sections. Uh, but, but there's a, a student of Alberto Bondano is working on a higher dimension. Uh, higher dimensional result using techniques similar to what uh, Oliver mentioned yesterday. Well, yeah, bot call techniques. All right, so this is the first set of invariants. Second set of invariants for the proof. So stop me if you have questions, please. Um, second sets of invariants, I call them Clark invariants. But they're actually not due to, uh, Clark is Francis Clark, actually former colleague from Lyon. Um, um, worked in early days of rep dynamics. Um, but actually, these invariants are not due to Clark. I call them Clark invariants because they are invariants associated to, uh, to the Clark action function, which is due to Clark. But these invariants were introduced by Eklan and Ofer. I call them Clark invariants so that we don't, dis we don't uh, confuse them with, um, uh, with the Eklan Ofer capacities. And it also respects uh, the, the, uh, the statement of Arnold that says that nothing is named after the real creator. So this is due to Eklan and Ofer. Almost nothing. Eklund and Hofer. So this is pre-capacities. It came before the capacities. So these are invariants that you can associate to a, a convex body. So let's consider a convex body in any dimension this time. So I'm going to go back to dimension 2n. So we are in R2n. That's, that's your R2n. And you have a convex body B, or perhaps, yeah, let's call it B now. I called it K before, I call it B now. It's not a round ball. It's a convex body. You can see it's convex from the picture. Um, so these are invariants for the characteristic foliation uh, on the boundary. And the characteristic foliation doesn't change if you shift the convex body around. So you can assume without loss of generality that the origin is enclosed, is, is within the interior of the, lies in the interior of B. And if you do that, you can talk. Uh, you can talk. Uh, you can introduce a canonical contact form uh, on the boundary. And see the characteristic foliation uh, as uh, leaves of the uh, as orbits of the, the characteristic leaves. You can see them as orbits of the red flow. So we introduce the Liouville form one half usual dual form one half x dy minus y dx on R two n. I'm going to denote by alpha uh, the restriction of lambda uh, to the boundary of B. Right, so, um, so I'm interested in the periodic orbits uh, on the boundary of these convex domains, and for that, uh, for, for a for convex domains, so the, the red flow on the boundary of the convex domains uh, form the easiest possible class of red flows to study, even easier, easier arguably than geodesic flows. And there's uh, one way to study them uh, with uh, variational methods uh, by means of what's called the Clark action function. Which many of you know, but perhaps not everyone because it's a little bit more exotic than the usual action functionals 
uh, although it's actually uh, arguably the simplest one to work with. Um, so it's a function that it's often denoted by capital Psi. It's defined on uh, some loop space, but it's not exactly the loop space of the boundary of B, nor the loop space of Rn. It's, I can tell you in a moment what it is, and you actually don't need, even need to know what it is, because you, you can just use the properties of it. So it, it's, uh, it's a strictly positive function. And uh, it's on this loop space, so this is a sort of space of loops, and so you have the action of the circle by time translation, and the function is invariant under this uh, time translation. And uh, it gives you a variational principle uh, for the closed rub orbits. So it's critical points with critical value tau are precisely uh, are in one to one correspondence with the fixed points of phi tau, so the tau periodic rub orbits, if you want. Now, let's see, I only I have 10 minutes left, right? Right, so let me not, if you don't mind, let me not define it. It's, 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 there are several versions of this function in the literature. It would take perhaps five minutes to define it. Um, they're all equivalent from, the, ah, I should say, this functional gives you this variational principle. And it's a good function for variational methods. You can apply Morse theory. For instance, if you want to find uh, uh, the orbits with the shortest possible period, you can just minimize it. And this function always achieves a minimum. Uh, you can take uh, uh, cohomology classes of the domain and do mean maxes and detect other orbits. Uh, there are several different uh, versions of this function in the literature. They're all equivalent from the point of view of Morse theory. They're all good for Morse theory. They all give the same invariance. It can be, it can be proved. It's, it's actually not hard. I actually worked out the details with Luca. Uh, Baracco. Uh, and, uh, right, so all you need to know about this function is that uh, its domains is pretty much, it's homotopy equivalent, uh, S1 equivariantly homotopy equivalent to uh, the sphere of infinite dimensional Hilbert space. So, the, in particular, the cohomology, S1 equivariant cohomology of its domain is polynomials in a variable E, where E is a generator of uh, H2S1 of lambda. So as a group, this is given by uh, E to the zero, which is the generator in degree zero, E to the one, E, sorry, E cup product with E, which I write as E squared, E cube, and so forth. Um, perhaps I go back, I raise the contact invariance. Now the clock invariance are a sequence of numbers which I denote by SK. Uh, of B, and they're equal, they're defined as the spectral invariant, spectral invariant, in the sense of Morse theory, of the function Psi, with respect to the cohomology class E to the K minus one. So these are critical values of the Clark action functionals. Uh, so they're defined for every K from one on. So you obtain an increasing sequence, uh, S1 of B, less than or equal to S2 of B, less than or equal, and so forth. S1 is really the minimum of your function, namely the systole of the boundary of your convex domain. It's the minimal period among all closed rub orbits in the boundary. And so 
Later on, I'm going to consider the ratio associated to this invariance. So sk hat of b is going to be sk of b divided by the volume. And you have to take the right power, 1 over n, so that it's scale invariant. All right, I'm running out of time, but hopefully I'll make, I'll make to a good point to stop. Um, now, um, let me mention the relevant theorems for these invariants, then enter into that proof. And then I will be short with time, so perhaps I will finish by voice. So the relevant theorems are actually three different theorems. I state them all together. So the first one is something uh, that we proved together with Baja Gorel and Victor Ginsburg uh, a few years ago. So it's due to Ginsburg, Gorel, and myself. It says that uh, the boundary of your convex domain is best, as I defined before, for the canonical contact form, uh, if and only if uh, SK of B is equal to SK plus N minus 1 of B for some K. And so it's, an if, it's really an if and only if. None of the implications is completely trivial, but the difficult one is from right to left particularly difficult one is from right to left. Uh, um, yeah, I'm going to call the K that satisfies these the relevant indices. They correspond to the relevant indices um, that they introduced for ellipsoids. Um, so this is the first point. Second point is something I, pr I proved a little bit later uh, with Marco Radeschi, a Riemannian geometer from Notre Dame. Radeschi. Um, so this is actually a lemma in the paper, but it's actually the crucial lemma. The, the main theorem that we give there is a, is a relatively direct consequence of the lemma. Uh, lemma says that uh, if uh, the boundary of our convex domain is best, uh, then uh, the function psi, the clock action function of psi, is perfect. Let me explain what I mean. So uh, perfect means that uh, perfect is in the sense of equivariant Morse theory. So if you, uh, you know, in, in Morse theory, you have a function. You, you take sublevel sets just above uh, the global minimum. They're not empty. And as you go up with the sublevel set, you reach a critical value. And when you go up again, if you're perfect, you keep adding topology. The topology always grows. There are never cancellations among critical points. And this is what happens. This is actually a pretty tricky statement. It uses, uh, so it's perfect for the equivariant Morse theory with rational coefficients, but it uses the torsion of the Morse theory with Z coefficients. So it's, it's quite tricky as a, as a statement. Unfortunately, I don't have time to explain it, but. Uh, right, in the Morse bot sense, for uh, rational, rational coefficient, S1 equivariant, Morse theory. For non S1 equivariant, there are always cancellations. It's not. And third point third point. So everything here holds in dimension, in arbitrary dimension. Now, in dimension four, um, if, so this is something that we worked out with then Christopher Gagdiner, CG, myself, but it's, it's actually a, an application of the classification of surface spaces. I have to work out a little bit. Um, in dimension two n equals four, uh, if db is best, then b is a rational ellipsoid, or more precisely, is symplectomorphic to a rational ellipsoid. Rational ellipsoid. 
So this means simple ectomorphic. Uh, right, so time is up. Uh, so basically I introduced all the uh, invariants that enter into the proof of the main theorem, but I didn't say anything. Uh, well, so how, how do we prove the main theorem with these invariants? So first of all, what we can prove, so perhaps I say, I'm gonna be a little bit quick towards the end and stop in two minutes. So um, now, conclusion of the proof, but actually when I write conclusion of the proof, it's more like the beginning of our, of our work. So for now I just gave the, uh, the, machinery, uh, the machinery involved in the proof. But basically what we can prove is the following. So two points, point one, says that, so let me take, uh, uh, let me take B0 such that, so B0 is a convex domain in dimension four, or actually in any dimension, such that, uh, oh, let's say dimension four, such that DB0 is Bess. Then, if you look at the, uh, so, right, so, now, if you look at the spectral values of B0, you have the systol, which is S1 of B0. All the spectral values appear, sorry, all the elements in the spectrum of the boundary of B0 appear as Clark invariants because of the perfectness of the Clark action function. So you have the first value, the second, S2, B0, and so on, up to a certain SK1, of B0, and K1 is the relevant index, so this is, uh, this is the common period, minimal common period of all the closed web orbits, okay? Now, what you do is assume that you perturb B0 in the C3 topology, and you get to uh, another C3 clause uh, convex body B1. Now, what happens to this spectral value? These spectral values are continuous with respect to even the C0 topology but certainly with respect to the C3 topology. Uh, so if you perturb, uh, let's say in the C2 topology, which is a bit, uh, bit stronger than what I'm claiming, claiming there. So these first the spectral values, so these are action values of isolated closed orbits. So at this, uh, so the, the, there's only one closed orbit, there, there are only finitely many closed orbits uh, taking these values. And uh, actually only one closed orbit taking this value, one can prove. So perhaps when you perturb, this value will move a little bit up. So it will get to S1 of B1. Uh, this value will move perhaps a little bit below. It will be S2 of B1. But, and so forth, but the this value here, which corresponds to the periodic orbits of minimal common period, uh, will bifurcate. So when you perturb, in general, this may create several critical values. For instance, three, let's say. And it's a theorem that SK1 of B1 is the minimal. It's a more theoretic theorem. It takes a little bit to be proved, because we're in equivariant homology. And, uh, it's a general fact of Morse theory applied to this special setting. So this is a first point of the proof and it can be generalized to any dimension. And uh, so using this fact, you can actually prove that, uh, you can actually prove that if you call Km of B0 the relevant indices, Namely, Km is the minima K such that SK is M times the minimal common period. Sorry, I don't write it, but. Uh, so if you introduce the relevant indices, you can prove that SKM of uh, B1 is always less than or equal to M times tau one of uh, tau K1 of B1, I'm almost done. 
And now we proved, uh, by, by the theorem I proved with Alberto Bondando and Christian Lange, this is less than or equal to m times tau k1 of b0, because b0, uh, or I should say the, the boundary of b1 and the boundary of b0, because tau k1 achieves its local maximum at the best, uh, at the best, uh, at the boundary of the best domain. And it turns out that this is equal to SKM of B0. So this is a little bit fast, but it proves that theorem for the Clark invariance, or at least one direction in that theorem for the Clark invariance. It proves that if B0 is a convex domain with Besse boundary, then it's a local maximizer uh, of uh, the Clark invariance at the relevant indices. And then one last uh, word, and I'm done, promised. How to go from the Clark invariance to the Eklanoffer capacities. Second point and end of the proof. Actually, last but one uh, point, but I'm really, really done. For every convex domain, convex body, B, the Eklanoffer capacity of B, we proved that it's bounded from above uh, by SK, or the Clark invariant of B, and is are equal uh, if uh, the boundary of B is best. So this, together with the theorem for the Clark invariance, proved one direction on the main theorem. It remains the other direction, namely that if a convex body or a star-shaped body is not simply ectomorphic to an ellipsoid, uh, then it's not a local maximizer of the capacity ratio, or actually of pretty much any symplectic or contact ratio you can come up with. And this is actually something very well known to the experts. Uh, but perhaps I stop here and uh, yeah, I can say it over coffee to some of you. <laughs>